Amen. But we praise him on this feast, this uh, time in which we, uh, we look at and we, we can see that there's so many uh, deeper things. Uh, when we say tent, nobody kind of bats an eyelash. But when you say sukkah, and everybody goes, what? A sukkah, it is uh, something that is uh, a temporary dwelling. It's a place in which uh, you don't, you're not going to live there for, uh, for 10 years, uh, maybe even a year. You're going to live there for a short period of time. Uh, when you go camping uh, out in the wilderness, you don't take the building materials with you to build a house. That would be impractical and, for most of us, painful. You, you go and you have a temporary dwelling, something that you can put up. Um, gosh, do you remember those old tents that you used to have to, like, put together? <laughs> now you just, like, take them out and it's like, push out. It's a pop-up tent. Uh, uh, we've, when we've been camping, we, there was, like, we'd get there, you know, you, you drive for two, three hours, five hours to get to some place, and, hike, you know, either it's a campsite or whatever, and then you get, you, you get all your gear there. Then you're interfaced with this monumental task of assembling Tinker Toys into a structure that will withhold, you know, it will hold up something to keep you from being rained on. So um, a sukkah is something that is, it's, it's just temporary. It's not going to last forever. Um, and of course, we use the, the analogy that this, that this body is like a sukkah. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's there for a short time uh, in the relative space of time. Uh, we get how many ever years that it is that, that we are, are, are allotted by the Lord. Uh, but um, so that, that's that. We, we read Leviticus uh, at the beginning of the, of the service. If you turn over to Numbers, um, Numbers chapter 29. Uh, Numbers is another one of the books of the Torah that you don't read through in a matter of like uh, hours. You kind of like crawl through it, chew through it. Um, it's, it has a lot of depth and a lot of detail in it. Uh, but it's just one of those things. Uh, again, the, the, the Torah, the, the, book, the five books of Moses, were, uh, they were a, an outline or a blueprint for the Holy Community to function. Uh, we're looking at Numbers 29 and verse 12. And it would help if I was in the right book. It's always helpful. Numbers 29. And we've got verse 12. Thank you. It says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work, and you shall keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. You shall present a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, as a sweet aroma to the Lord, 13 young bulls, two rams, and 14 lambs in their first year, and they shall be without blemish. Their grain offering shall be mixed, or shall be of a fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an epa for each of the 13 bulls, and two tenths for each of the two rams, and one tenth for each of the fourteen lambs. Also one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and besides the regular burnt offering, its grain offering and drink offering. And it goes then through each of the days, and it will describe the offering that was to be offered. Uh, if you'll just jump over to verse 35. It says, On the eighth day you shall have a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work. Wow, so seven days, uh, it says, and then on the eighth day, which it doesn't specifically say at the beginning, but the eighth day, because the eighth day is, is very special. Uh, and we'll, again, we'll look at that next week uh, when we celebrate the eighth day uh, on Shabbat. Uh, but this, this feast was to be a, a time which was set aside, uh, and you do special things in, in this period of time. Uh, you do some things that you don't normally do in a year. You use uh, certain um, implements or, or um, fruit that you you don't normally use in, in the same way, and, and it's a very special time of rejoicing because this feast is of the greatest significance because it points to a future time. Uh, it, it celebrates, just, I'll just ask this question. So when was the first Suk, Sukkot celebrated? Coming out of Egypt, in the desert, that's right. Right? So Passover was, was the feast that got us out of Egypt? Sukkot is the celebration of coming out of Egypt. What, what is Egypt a symbol of? The world, death, bondage, sin, slavery, evil. Uh, and then to be released from that, um, who wouldn't rejoice, right? Um, I mean, if you just came from, uh, from Siberia, from, from the Gulag, not to mention it's cold there, 
I know. But if you got out of Siberia uh, during Cold War uh, Russia days, uh, you'd probably be rejoicing. Um, and, and so we, we look at this and we say, well, where, where are the dots connected? Well, the, it is a rejoicing because we've been freed. Uh, we've been released from something that is terrible. Uh, and what have we been freed from? Egypt? No, it, it, we haven't been freed from Egypt. We've been freed from something greater than that. Sin? Sin? What else? Bondage, Bondage death? Slavery. Slavery. Darkness. And darkness. Because all human beings are born into a darkness. And, and, and what is the darkness that's present? It's, it's, it's actually the, the inheritance of the brokenness of, of our humanity. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, they broke us. And we, every single child that's born in gets this brokenness. Uh, they have, it's like they have a broken light bulb. Um, what's, the pur- what's the purpose of the light bulb? <coughs> to be broken? Uh, to look good? To illuminate, to give you sight. And so when we come to faith, when we come to God, um, it's like, I don't know if this bugs you, but this really bugs me. I go to the grocery store uh, or to wherever it is I buy my lighting. Maybe it's Home Depot. Maybe it's Big Lots. And I buy a package of light bulbs. And I get home. And the first light bulb I pull out there, and I screw it into the thing, and what happens? It doesn't light up. Why? Because that little thingy in there is broken. You know, the little thingy that like... <laughs> the filament, thank you. The filament's broken. The glass is fine. The, the, the other little thingies are great, but that little filament, thank you, is hanging there going... It's broken. It looks good. Is not going to work. And that's how we're born into this world like that. We're born with a vessel with something broken inside. And when God releases us from slavery, he reconnects that filament. And what happens now when it's plugged in? Looks good. ka It's beautiful. So this is a celebration of, of being freed from Darkness, bondage, slavery. And every single soul that's born into this world is born into slavery. Not because God desires it, not because God wanted it, but because we broke it. And now he's fixing it. And he's letting you and I help with, with the whole fixing. The, the Tikkun Olam is the fixing of the world according to traditional Jewish uh, terminology. This fixing of the world. And you and I are fixing the world right here, starting right here. There's a whole lot of work to be done right here. And sometimes he allows you and I to help to fix little bits and things here by being kind to people, by being uh, whatever it is, showing God to people through our actions and, and, and maybe, maybe through our words. And so we, we, we are participating in this renovation of the world, starting with this, taking the own, you know, the own, uh, our own plank out of our eye and the, and the speck out of our own eyes first, allowing God to heal this part first. Got to get reconnected. And so this is what we celebrate on this, this feast. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 13. It says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, and when you have gathered from your threshing floor and your winepress, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days shall you keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place that your Lord shall choose. Because your Lord your God will bless you in all of your produce and the work of your hands and you shall surely rejoice. So, what does he tell us to do? Uh, again, imagine that we're back in Israel. We're, we're back in the time where we were living there. And what was happening at this time of the year? Harvest. Okay, it was a harvest. Uh, and what do you do in the harvest? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's that? Yeah, the grapes and wine. Okay, so, so it, it's a gathering of the fruit. I mean, this is the, the, uh, the fruit harvest. Uh, so we did the grain, the barley, and, the, and so on and so forth. Um, in the spring, now we're in the fall, and we have delicious pumpkins, which to make pumpkin chili, which I don't think this particular pumpkin will survive to be made into pumpkin chili, but we shall see. Um, it, it's an appreciation of the fruit of the earth. Um, long before the days of prepackaged foods, 
processed foods and um, genetically modified organisms, <laughs> we had real food, uh, which was grown in the ground, not hydroponically. And, and we, we harvested those things and we, and we got, brought them together um, and we rejoiced. One, why are, why are, we, are we happy? Because we've got pumpkin pie now. I mean, who wouldn't be happy with pumpkin pie? We're rejoicing because of, of, the, of the fruit of the labors that we have done and we've harvested our land and, and, we, and we rejoice. Are we just happy to, to have this stuff? Are we, happy, are we just happy because now we've got all this stuff? What's the other joy? Thankful. Being thankful. And what else? Sharing it with people. Uh, at this point, uh, many times, uh, the book of Ruth is read. Um, what, is this, what is the overall story of the book of Ruth? Who is Ruth? Okay, so, so she's a Gentile who married an Israelite who died. And, and then she, she marries... Right, so, so she marries a kinsman, a redeemer. What's the one aspect of the story that, is participate, that she participates in that is be relative to Sukkot? Which is what? Gathering. Okay, it's the gathering. So God said um, elsewhere in the Torah, don't gather from the corners of, of your property. So you can imagine a big square. He says, make it circular, so to speak, and leave the edges for those who do not have. He says, Leave it there and, and, and let people gather it for, for, because there will be many people that, that don't have anything. They don't have any land or they don't have enough. And so you are, 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 are giving to them and, and they don't have to ask. Um, you don't have to ask to harvest from the corners of the property. It was, it was, just, it was understood. It was, it was a part of, um, of the code uh, from the Torah. So this, this was, was, was left there for those that, that would be blessed by it. Um, it's a custom in uh, Sukkot to have uh, um, Ushpazin, which, which is a great movie. If you've never watched it before, it could be on one of the major um, video providers. Um, you can definitely find it on eBay. Um, it's a fun story. Uh, it, and Ushpazin technically is an uninvited surprise visitor. So this, this um, feast is, is, is open. Uh, many times um, there will be families um, in a Jewish neighborhood that didn't have a whole lot, um, and, and those that had would, would offer, come have dinner with us tonight. Um, and it was considered a blessing to be able to bless. So this is a time in which um, you know, the, the whole community should rejoice, um, and, and we want everybody to be participating in the rejoicing, so we were able to share that with, with everyone. So it says, continuing, if I can find my place again. Aha, verse 16. Three times a year shall your males appear before the Lord your God in the place that he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles. It shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And everyone is to give as they are able according to the blessing of the Lord which he has given to you. So, a curious note. Why did it say for, for the men to technically go to Jerusalem? Why didn't it say Everybody. Okay, but the head, um, well, basically, um, it, it, was, it was basically said, you know, for men, um, you're commanded to go. Um, and if you're able to bring your family, then Baruch Hashem. But many times, um, if a woman has just given birth, she's not able to travel for a long distance. Um, if you have maybe even small children that would not be able to make the travel, um, then, you know, so there, there's provision uh, for, for those that, that wouldn't be able to travel. Um, it became the custom later uh, for um, a village to be able to send a family to Jerusalem because many times n hardly anybody in the village could afford to go. But so they, they kind of pooled together to be able to send a representative from their village to be able to be there in Jerusalem. And that was uh, perhaps uh, the story we see that Yeshua and his family and John and Yochanan uh, they're, they're there in Jerusalem. Um, you know, maybe it was their, their turn to be able to go because, again, it was very expensive to travel. So we see that, as we've said before, that Sukkot is the harvest of fruit, and that we know that Shavuot um, in the spring is, is, a, is the grain festival, uh, or, the, the, or I guess celebrating the, the um, 
gathering of the grains. This is a Sukkot is a time of joy and restored fellowship with God. Sukkot is a time of joy and restored fellowship with God. Why? Why is it that? Because everything is in order in Rosh Hashanah. We examined ourselves. Mm-hmm. So in the, in, in the times of, of the fall holy days, we have Rosh Hashanah, which is a call to repentance, a call to examine ourselves. We get to Yom Kippur, which is a very solemn time to come before God, um, to continue that repentance before Him. Um, and then on the other side of Yom Kippur, we have this time of rejoicing. Um, and as, as Wanda said, um, you see, it isn't about being perfect. Um, it's about being, in what proximity are we to the light? God is light and he is holiness. And, and, and how close we are to the light, is it, that's what it's about. Sin moves us further and further away from the light. Repentance draws us closer to God. Forgiveness, salvation is, is being drawn to God, to the light. Sharon? Yeah, so it, it's, again, this restoring of something. If you think of something that's restored, what do you think? How was it before the restoration? It's broken. Um, some of you are, are antiquers. And some of you are refinishers. Some of you uh, can, can see a piece that, that anybody else will look at and go, it's hopeless. But you see that, and, and you say, no, I, 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 can, I can see it how, how it could be. I, I can see what it would be like if, if, I, if I took time and, and, and sanded it down. Uh, time to fill in some of those broken places and, and sand it and smooth it and, and get it so that, that, it's, that it's ready for the next step, which is the moisturizing of, of the dryness. And then once it's been the wood has been moisturized and it, and it, is, it has life back in it, then what do you do to it? You, you put a sealant on it. It seals in the good thing. See, you, you and I are, are, can be like that with people. Um, we can see people and, and we can go, they're hopeless. We can say our, to ourselves, unfortunately, sometimes, I'm hopeless. But we're not. And they're not. Do we see people as worthless and hopeless? Or do we see them for how they could be in God? But, but they're foul-mouthed and, and, they're, and they're vicious and they're, and they're... Yeah, but can you imagine them different? Pray for the difference. And let God do his work. Yeah, but they're, but they're this or they're that. Yeah, well, you know what? You, you know, if, if you weren't like them, then one of us in this room probably was like them. And maybe we still struggle with those things. But we're in process. Bill? Bill said, if we see other people's sins as greater than our own, we're both deceived and fools. It's true. Um, if we can see ourselves as, as, as greater in sinfulness than another, even though that, that doesn't change them, it only allows us to be able to see ourselves for how we are. Repentance, humbleness, hum, to, be, to be humble before God draws us closer to the light. And it's, it's, it's drawing close to the light in which we're able to receive the benefit of it. If you're out in the forest, in Siberia, you want a forest. You, you, you want a nice fire to warm yourself. I mean, if you're in the, the darkness and the cold, you want the light so you can see. And so drawing close to God is, is that filling ourselves with his illumination and, his, and, and, and it begins to change and we begin to see people differently.
and we see ourselves differently. What was the, the general response whenever uh, the glory of God entered in, into the temple at the time of the dedication? What happened to the priests? It knocked them to the ground. They, they became weak and, and, and dropped to the ground. Why? Did, 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 did God a little, get a little bit crazy there and like blow some wind in there? It was the glory. When the presence of God happen, or comes into a place, something occurs. You, you experience something um, if you're spiritually attuned and, and, and you will respond in a variety of ways. Um, to be close to fire, something's going to happen. Uh, if you put a, a marshmallow into a, a fire, what happens to it? It becomes worthy of s'mores, I know. <laughs> but it melts and gets gushy and gooey. It transforms. It transforms. I don't really want a s'more now. <laughs> Something changes that. It doesn't stay the same. It doesn't sit there and go, I'm not going to change. It responds to the fire. In the same way, when, when you draw close to God, there's change. There's, there's, there's a, a, an experience and you may not feel it in the, in the physical, or you might, but there is a change that happens. In Sukkot, we remember his provision for us. When we left Egypt, uh, we didn't have stuff. He gave us what we needed. And when we have left our old life in the way of death, he, he's, he's given us and provided for us our, our spiritual needs, and our physical needs to be able to move forward. He's gifted us with these things. When we celebrate Sukkot, it's remembering his great love for us. Um, if we have nothing else, we should rejoice because of his love. We have God. And there is nothing, there's no physical object or event or anything that, is, that can compare with having God. That we believe that we bear God within us. That God lives within us. I feel like we've lost that in our times. We say it, yeah, Jesus lives in my heart. But we don't get it. If we believe that he lived in us, then we would not be who we are at this moment. We would be something greater and better. We would be transformed and being transformed. And we are. But to know that God lives within each of us that you are a walking mishkan. Oh, this, is, this is not a commercial. <laughs> you, are, you bear God within you. I mean, the only more, only more visceral way that I can think of it is when, when our mother Miriam was pregnant with the Messiah, she was within him. Sorry, he was within her. He, wherever she went, he went. Why? Because he was inside of her. She carried him, literally, within her, wherever she went. She couldn't dodge him. Uh, she couldn't get away from him. She couldn't play hide-and-go-seek, because there he is. And like that, you and I bear God within us, who dwells within the inner sanctum of the heart, the spiritual heart within us. Do we ever think of that? We ever, and that, that mean, we think of the Bet HaMikdash, the holy temple in, in Jerusalem, as this great and glorious place, and, and it was. But you are greater than that. Because there is no holy temple anymore. You. And God willing me are that temple where the Shekinah, the glory of God, lives within us. And that's awesome if we can wrap our heads in. We can't, but we can sure try around it. It is a time to be grateful to God. At the very minimum, you woke up today. You may not wanted to get up today, but you had the, the privilege of being able to awaken today where many millions, perhaps, at least hundreds of thousands of people did not this morning, or they did to awaken to a struggle, whatever that was. We have breath, and, and that is a gift to us. It is a time to remember the storehouse that he gives to his children in his presence and he is taking care of us. You see, what we have is based upon what, how we've responded to him. 
it can all go away like that. But so if we give glory to God for what he's blessed us with, um, it is, this is a time to rejoice and to remember that. And we've already said that, again, the greatest gift that we should be rejoicing on, aside from his presence, is being freed from slavery. To be freed from where we, where we were. And, and again, your story may be different than the person sitting next to you. You may have been raised as a believer. Um, you may have not. You may have come to faith later in your life, whatever that looks like. But to remember and give glory to God for having brought you out of darkness, having resurrected you, reconnected the filament so that light can shine out of you. Because it's not about doing nice stuff. It's about doing holy things that come from God living within us. We traditionally ascribe that uh, during Sukkot, uh, that Mashiach, that Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, was born. Why would we say that? What would be one of the bases that we, that we, would, we would offer that? What's that? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Uh-huh. Uh, the Gospel of John says that the Word of God was made flesh and tabernacled, dwelt with us. Um, he didn't live for very long, relatively speaking, but he came in the flesh, this tabernacle, this mishkan, and he, and he, and he was present with us. In this feast, it, as glorious as his first coming was and as necessary, his second coming is even greater. The first came as, as a way to be able to free us, to be able to return to God. And when he comes back again, he's, he's allowing us to be and, and to be exercising his power and authority in the kingdom, in the literal kingdom that's established. See, right now, there's little beachheads of the kingdom of God right now within each of you and our brothers and sisters no matter what they call themselves, whatever Christians or whatever messianics, whatever, all over the world, the kingdom of God has, has been established in these hearts, in these little lights everywhere. And, and, and he, he's, he's basically taking this world one heart at a time. One soul at a time. He, the kingdom of God is taking this earth back. And so this is a time in which we should re- be rejoicing. If you turn over to the book of Zechariah, <clears throat> Prophet Zechariah. To me, this is one of the most exciting passages. Um, I don't believe that any other of the feasts have this particular, I guess, emphasis. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14. This is looking to the future, to a time that has not yet come, to a time in which uh, Messiah is returned or is in the process of returning. Zechariah chapter f- uh, 14 and verse 3. It's, he has returned, and it says that, of course, we know that you know, the enemies have gathered against him. It says that the Lord shall go forth and fight against these nations as he fights in the day of battle, and on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem in the east. And the Mount of Olives sh- shall split in two from east into west making a very great valley, and half the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of it shall move towards the south. So this is literally a a picture of, and I don't know if it's being poetic, that his feet will touch the Mount of Olives, but when they do, something happens. What happens? Um, The eagle has landed. And, and he is the great eagle. He is, he is, he is the one who, is, um, who has finally come. Uh, and, and when he returns, um, again, like a marshmallow next to a fire, the earth changes because the great light has come. It says, continuing, that then you shall, you shall flee through the mountain valley, and the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. And you shall... Uh, Flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and thus the Lord my God will come, and all of the saints with you. So, I mean, this is not New Testament that Christians made up, and I say that tongue-in-cheek. This is prophecies from the foundation, that the saints, the righteous ones, the Kadoshim, will return with the Lord. And there's going to be a whole and great company of heaven, as the apostle writes, it's going to be amazing, glorious, beautiful. 
And who else is coming along with the Messiah and, and, and the saints? The angels, a whole host of heaven. Um, gosh, that's a, a countless number. Uh, it's a brilliant, if, if you can imagine it in your mind, and we can only get little glimpses of, of possibilities, but it's amazing. And I don't know what the armies think that they're going to do when they, when they go up against Messiah. I don't know if they, if, if they just simply see a single person. And again, I'm, I'm using poetic license here to attempt to describe it. A single man floating in the sky, uh, and they go, yeah, we got this. No worries. When Elisha tapped his servant and said, Lord, open his eyes, what, what did that servant see? Who Normally, there was just, just a bunch of empty hills out there, but then what did he see? He saw the, the angels, and oh my gosh, wow. It was phenomenal. And his, his eyes could see. So I don't know if at that moment the Lord says, open their eyes. And the whole host of the saints and the whole company, the armies of heaven are present in that time, in that place. I don't, I don't know. But that's, that's how I, I envision that in which he returns and it's powerful and it's glorious and it is the king has come. And let us go out to meet him. It says that it shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light, and the lights will diminish, and it, in, it shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but in the evening time that it shall happen that it, it will be light. And in that day it shall be that the living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea. Jump down to verse 13, please. And it shall come to pass in that day that though a great panic from the Lord will be among them, and everyone will seize at the hand of his neighbor and raise the hand against his neighbor's hand. And Judah will also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold and silver, and apparel in abundance. Such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule and the camel and the donkey, and all of those cattle that will be in those camps shall this plague be. For it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came up to Jerusalem, or came up against Jerusalem, shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So what does that say? What does it say? Okay, so uh, th this army, which you know, is, is often is, is referred to as the Battle of Armageddon, uh, a great battle, that there's going to be a lot of like wounded, broken people after that. And it's going to be our job as his administrators to gather up the wounded and begin to help them to, to be able to come to a, a true and meaningful life. Can you imagine reestablishing um, places for people to live? Um, all of, of the logistics of that, of, of creating new cities or, 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 or communities. Or, it, it's going to be huge. There's going to be a lot of work to do. Um, they're going to be so broken and, and damaged. If you've ever seen any, any pictures from from the Holocaust or, or for prisoners of war, they're numb and staring and, and they need kindness and patience and humility and all the qualities of God to be able to help them to come back perhaps to sanity. And so that will be a part of yours and my and all of those who, who keep his ways faithful ones, to be able to participate in, in the, the renovation of the world, beginning one soul at a time. And it says that everybody will go up to Jerusalem. I don't know how that's going to happen. But God's got it down. I don't have to worry about it. But everybody who's, who's left will go up to Jerusalem to do what? This. To celebrate Sukkot. Uh, to, to rejoice before God. And they'll have to learn how to rejoice. And, and they'll have to go through the same uh, struggles that you and I go. When we go, we have to, want us to wave some leaves? Yes. We give children simple tasks to teach them greater things. And, and you and I are his children, amen? And so he gives us simple tasks. And we can choose to do them or not. But he wants us to, to learn the small things so that we can be entrusted with great things in the future. 
It says that it should be that whenever the families of the earth, this is verse 17, of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king of the Lord of hosts, on them will be no rain. So he's going to say, come up to Jerusalem. And they won't. And what happens if you don't have any rain? Stuff doesn't grow. Uh, you don't have what you need. And there's, so there, there is a result that happens from disobedience, just like there is today. And he wants to teach them, and he's not going to let them starve to death, but he, he's going to utilize those, those things as ways to teach what it means to follow the king. It says it in verse 18, that the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in. They shall have no rain. And they shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations that do not come up to feast the tabernacle, to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. Isn't it interesting that he would mention Egypt in this particular prophetic passage? Because what are we celebrating today in addition to, to the feast? Freedom, the coming out of Egypt. So he utilizes Egypt as a way to emphasize the connection. Because we could say, well, Passover's in the spring and Sukkot's in the... Well, at that time, Sukkot happened right after Passover. Because there, there the other feasts weren't, weren't, they weren't, you could say, put into place. So he wants us to look back so that we can look forwards to see of the significance. It says in verse 20, In the day, holiness to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses. Where was the holiness of the Lord generally only, ascribed, or only inscribed on? To the high priest's crown that he wore. This, this plate that was, was, it was, it was tied over his turban, and it was a gold plate, because God doesn't do second best. It said holiness to the Lord on it. But it says in this time, everything's going to be so holy that it's going to be on the bells that the horses wear. That's basically saying everything. So God is he's making everything holy, even, even things that we wouldn't necessarily describe. It says it shall be inscribed, engraved on the bells of the horses, and the pots in the, Lord house, in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. And everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. And in that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord. So everybody's homes where they, where they eat every day, even the pots will be utilized in holy ways. It, it's it, it basically saying that everything's going to be holy. Uh, when we sit down to eat and we, and we, we work hard to, to prepare a meal, um, and we, we do this, and do we, we go, I can't wait to eat? Or do we pause and thank the Lord? We, we sanctify this food not because the food's amazing, maybe it is, but because where it's going should be amazing. Be because we should be, we should be holy unto the Lord, and therefore what we consume should be going to this, this vessel which is God's. So he says, and there shall no longer be a, a Canaanite in the house of the Lord. What was that a symbol of, Canaanite? Sinful person. Okay, sinful person, unbeliever, what else? What's that? Disobedient. Disobedient? The Gentiles. Okay. So, does it mean that Gentiles are bad? No. No, it just means that God wants everyone to be a part of, of, of the holy community. Um, because when, when you come to faith, you're, you're, you're no longer a Gentile. You're, you're grafted into the holy community to Messiah's Israel. It's a mystery, and you can't go around necessarily saying that I'm a Jew. But you can say, I'm adopted into the family, because it's true. And adopted, someone who's adopted into a family shares all of the benefits and the legal entitlements, and I mean that in the best way, of what it means to be part of the family. And there's no second place or second best in the kingdom, because we're all one in Messiah. Amen? Book of Revelation, and we'll close here. When Messiah um, entered into Jerusalem um, on a colt on, of a donkey, what, what happened um, as he entered into Jerusalem? They were worshiping him. What were they using to worship him? 
palm branches. That makes total sense. Well, it, it says we don't get it because it doesn't mean anything to us, per se. It was a symbol of something. Um, it was a symbol of, of honor to wave. Um, and what else did they do? They took their, their, their outer cloaks on and they put it down on the ground. And then they also, I believe, it wasn't that they put the, the branches on the ground? Um, they, were, they were giving everything over. And it was, it was a physical demonstration of something. Because no sooner uh, did he uh, enter into Jerusalem than they gave him up to be crucified. But that was a, a sign of welcoming the king. And, and so the waving, and at that time they, they waved the uh, palm branches. If you can imagine, hundreds, thousands of, of them waving. Well, this is one little branch. You hear that? Imagine thousands of that happening. That would be like a, a deafening sound. And, and what were they crying out? Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And, and, what, and what does Hosanna mean? It isn't a music label. Save us. That's right. Save us, we pray. Hosanna. Um, and it was a, a, a deafening sound, a, this beautiful sound. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 it says in verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding well the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or, or the tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, so we have sealed the servants of the Lord our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And it goes down through the, each of the tribes and mentions that 12,000 were sealed. In verse 9, And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude of which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, Peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all of the angels who stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. This whole great time in the future in which we celebrate in, in a very humble way today, to look to that time in which the whole multitude of heaven and those that have, will be gathered from the earth will praise and worship him. Salvation is drawing close to God, being changed by him becoming healed as human beings, having the filament reconnected and a greater light shining through us. You know the dimmer switch on your wall? He wants it totally lit, man. He wants it bright. So may we be those that submit ourselves to him so he can work through us and shine through us in the greatest way possible. Amen. Abba, we ask and pray that you would touch our hearts today that you would teach us what it means to worship and to love, what it means to rejoice before you. And Father, we thank you for this time in which we, your mishpacha family, a community, are able to gather and remember you, to honor you in all things in this time in which we join with our brothers and sisters over this earth. Father, both Jewish people who do not know Messiah yet and other messianic believers and Christians who remember this time, who look to the future, and we we'll celebrate you now. We love you and praise you and thank you for this. And we ask that in Yeshua's name, amen.